Hey there, sport. I uh, hope you don't mind me saying, but you're looking a little bit naked. To be perfectly honest, you look like a jackass, but you know, it really doesn't have to be that way. Because folks, regardless of whether it's Demon Souls, the Dark Souls trilogy, Bloodborne or Elden Ring, one thing is for damn sure. There are a heaping helping of awesome and interesting armour and clothing sets available for you to play dress up with. Fashion Souls, as it were. In fact, across these six games there are around 450 sets in total, and that doesn't even include the special pieces of equipment that aren't part of a full set. The mechanical purpose of armour is to give you an extra defensive edge in specific combat situations. Going up against the Moonlight Butterfly, consider putting on the Sorcerer's set for extra magic protection. Taking on Rom, the Vacuous Spider, why not don the Tomb Prospector set for its high arcane resistance? Planning on delving down into the abyss for a shadowy showdown with the Four Kings? Hey. Why not stick on Havel's armour like a coward, so as to tank and poise through the damage thanks to its sky-high physical defence? But you know, let's be honest about what's really important when choosing which armour to wear. Does it look cool? Great fire defence? Meh. Don't care as long as it looks cool. Excellent thrust? Resistance? Meh. Not interested. If it looks slick, I'm wearing it, otherwise don't even talk to me. Thus, I thought why not make a video on what I consider to be the 50 coolest armour sets in all of Soulsborne, the, as they say in Gay Paris, creme de la creme. Even though most folk like to mix and match pieces from different sets to achieve optimal levels of aesthetic excellence, this video will strictly be about pure armour sets, and for each set I'll be discussing how to get them, key visual details, and I'll even talk about associated enemies, bosses and lore. Just for clarity, although I will occasionally bring them up, stats and buffs and such are not the focus of this video at all, and also this is not a ranking. I will be discussing these sets in a specific order, but it won't be from worst to best or vice versa. I just don't consider it worthwhile and interesting to rank them. They're all sick in different ways. Though if folks enjoy this, I might be inclined to put together another project on the next 50 coolest armour sets too. Please allow me to give my marvellous patrons a massive thanks for supporting the channel. And with all that being said, let's kick off the list with our first armour set. I had a good old think about what might make for the best set to start off with, but when looking at my big list, as my eyes glazed over the words Elite Knight Set, I knew I had my answer. As well as it looking really, really slick, a special aspect of the Elite Knight Set is that it's one of, I believe, only four sets to appear in all three Dark Souls games, with the others being the Katarina, Dark and Havel sets. Yes, the Knights and Xanthus sets also appear in all three games, but their designs were changed fairly significantly for Dark Souls 3, and so they do not quite count. But who cares about the damn Knight set when you've got the Elite Knight set to wear? And I'm just now realising how many times I'm going to be saying the word set in this video. I'm sorry, but it's unavoidable. Set. In Dark Souls 1, both the Knights and the Elite Knight sets can be found in Darkfruit Forest, though while the former is right down where the Infernal Hydra lurks in the basin, the Elite Knights is situated in the section with all the Stone Guardians just before the Moonlight Butterflies arena. Of course, the very first time you see the Elite Knight set is right at the start of the game, being what Oscar of Astora is wearing when he drops the dungeon cell key down to you, but which you can get an even better look at as he lays dying after having been struck down by the Asylum Demon, and yet again later on if you return to the Undead Asylum, where he has gone fully hollow. Plus, Prince Rickard is also wearing the set if you fight him on top of Sen's Fortress. For Dark Souls 2, there's not any actual characters to be seen with the Elite Knight set on, though you can find a nameless hammer-wielding enemy wearing it in Elaine Lois, near to where you pick up the Priestess Eye. The item description in Dark Souls 1 mentions that this armour is worn by Elite Knights of Astora, which is also where Andre and Solaire happen to be from, though I don't think the word Astora is mentioned anywhere in Dark Souls 2, but the armour description for the Elite Knights set here simply saying that it's an old-time favourite of Elite Knights. Yeah, no shit. For Dark Souls 3, however, the name of Astora is still remembered throughout the land, though it's known as a fallen ruined kingdom in this game, rather than the grand holy land it once was. 
Andre of Astora wears the Elite Knight set this time round, though tragically the only way to get it without going through their entire quest line is to kill them and then buy it from the Shrine Maiden. Well, come on, I could never do that. Like many of FromSoft's most appealing armours, this one is rather asymmetrical, with the left side being covered by a bulky steel pauldron, steel glove and elbow guard, while the right side is comparatively less armoured, though still featuring sufficient protection. This would perhaps be for the left side to have more bracing potential, used for wielding a shield, while the right side requires more flexibility for swinging around swords and such. I also really like the little pouches around the waist, and there's even a small sheathed dagger hanging at the right side, regardless of whether or not you actually have a dagger equipped. I suppose in a sense, the Elite Knight set is rather traditional in its appearance. I mean, there's really nothing too outrageous or outlandish about it, but at the same time its crests, colours and small details give it this really appealing bright character, though some of that character certainly comes from the rather pleasant characters we meet throughout the Dark Souls who actually wear this set. What more can I say about it? It's a damn Dark Souls classic and is always one of my go-to armours when playing these classic games on Dark Souls 2. And speaking of Dark Souls 2, the second set on the list is one originally found in it, though it would also make a cameo appearance in the third game. It's the Drakeblood set. As with just about every set of armour on this list, you see enemies wearing it before you get to try it on yourself. It's not long at all before you get introduced to a dragon in Dark Souls 2's Crown of the Sunken King DLC, with Sen roaring to life and flying off into the heart of Sanctum City. And indeed, after making it through the Dragon Sanctum, you enter into Dragon's Rest, which, instead of being populated by noxious Sanctum soldiers and spectral Sanctum knights, is home to roaming Drake Blood Knights, who are far more sleekly, stylishly and darkly dressed, and graciously they're set can be picked up from a corpse. Of course, at the bottom of Dragon's Rest, the dragon, Sin, awaits, and indeed the Drakeblood Knights do have a close relationship with Sin, with her former leader, Yorg, having pierced the slumbering dragon with his spear, which you can still see poking out the front of its chest. Yorg did this to claim Sin's blood, hence these warriors' names, the Drakeblood Knights, though instead of them all being rewarded and imbued with magnificent draconic power, Shulva was subject to a miasmic cataclysm as the dragon awoke, blanketing the city in a poisonous fog, though several Drakeblood Knights still roam the heights and depths of Dragon's Rest. In Dark Souls 3, a Drakeblood Knight spawns in from seemingly nowhere up in Archdragon Peak, quite close to the stony shrine of Calumet. As far as I know, there's no reference to Sin or Shulva in Dark Souls 3, but after beating this lone warrior, a Drakeblood set can be picked up from a corpse back behind where you fought King Osiris. Even though this set does appear in both Dark Souls 2 and 3, I definitely think it looks better in the second game. The design is essentially the same in both games, but whereas it has a sort of black iron colour with silver ornate inlays on the chest piece in Dark Souls 2, it's kind of the inverse in the third game, with the more silver colour to the armour with darker inlays. And furthermore, the blood red cape with its golden dragon design looks somewhat faded here, though I guess this does lend itself to the prevailing theme in Dark Souls 3 of everything in the world falling ever more to ruin, rot and decay. All in all, very cool armour set that is made more flavourful thanks to its associated lore. I like how a dragon theme is present in its design, but not overly so. Not like, say, the malformed dragon set from Elden Ring, which straight up features a dragon hood ornament on its helm. A helm ornament, which, in my opinion, looks fucking ridiculous. Next up, we have the Iron Dragon Slayer set from Dark Souls 3. Of course, you could get Ornstein's set in Dark Souls, worn by Dragon Slayer Ornstein, and the old Dragon Slayer from Dark Souls 2 is also to be found wearing this armour, though sadly you cannot get your hands on the set in that game. You can in Dark Souls 3, however, after nailing the Nameless King in Archdragon Peak. But we're not talking about those sets, as refined, detailed and leonine as they are. We are talking about the set worn by the Dragon Slayer armour, fought on the bridge leading to the Grand Archives at the top of Lothric Castle. While this is where the Dragon Slayer armour is fought as a proper mandatory boss, though its armour does not drop, and nor can it be purchased from the Shrine Maiden at Firelink Shrine like most other boss armours, but 
if you once again take on this foe in the murky swamps of the Ring City, where it lays at the far end in a crumpled metallic heap before erupting back into thunderous animation for one final battle, thankfully, blessedly, it does drop its armour, and thank goodness it does, because I love it even more so than the regular Dragon Slayer set. Whereas the set that it's based on is rather complex and even elaborate in its design, all that refinement is out the window here. Instead of dark jagged grooves and ornate inlays, the Iron Dragon Slayer set is a warped mass of heavy iron, appearing as if it had been twisted and brutally moulded into shape in some unspeakable forging process, before later being imbued with life by the enormous pilgrim butterfly we see floating up into the sky at the beginning of the encounter, the same one which later falls back down upon the Dragon Slayer armour's defeat. Whereas the headpiece of Onstein's armour is loosely based on the appearance of a lion, what with that being Onstein's own sigil as one of the four knights of Gwyn, the Iron Dragon Slayer's general design is far more monstrous, not really resembling any real world animal. Rather, it looks like just moving your finger along one of its crude edges would result in a nasty cut, especially along the mid portion of the helm with its wicked blade moustache design, for want of a better term. I absolutely love the Dragon Slayer armour boss fight. It is intense and hype as fuck, but its monstrous appearance with its warped homage to Dragon Slayer Ornstein is a massive part of that. It takes a design every Dark Souls fan knows well, and twists it into something bigger, stronger and scarier, and I was glad as hell when I got the chance to try on the armour for myself in the Ringed City. And at number 4 we have Smoe Set, which is of course somewhat related to the armour we just spoke about. With Smoe being one of the knights tasked with guarding and prolonging the illusion of Princess Guinevere in Anor Londo, alongside Ornstein. Some of you might have just balked at me referring to Smo as a knight, but while he was most certainly not one of the four elite knights of Gwyn, the item description for his hammer in Dark Souls 3 does clearly refer to him as a knight, though more notoriously than that, he was known as Executioner Smo. This is another armour set to appear in more than one game too. In Dark Souls 1, after defeating Ornstein and Smo in Anor Londo, you can purchase it from Donal of Zena, and yes, believe it or not, that is the way Donal is pronounced, it's like Tonal but with a D. Sadly, Smo set would not appear in Dark Souls 2 and nor is there any mention of Smo at all in that game. Though of course Dark Souls 3 was highly referential of the first game in the trilogy, and indeed Smo's great hammer can be found in what remains of Anor Londo, while his set can be purchased from the Shrine Maiden after Aldrich is defeated. I just spoke about how the Iron Dragon Slayer set is essentially Ornstein's set, but made way more twisted and heavy and frightening. But no warping or twisting is even necessary when it comes to Smo's set, because this armour is big and intimidating enough as it already is. I love armour sets where the helms are fashioned after the form of a face, because it gives off a uniquely unsettling and near robotic aura, with the way the metallic face never changes expression regardless of whether you or the enemy is winning the battle. It's what I really like about the Looking Glass Knight, though that set is not one of my picks for this list. I just feel it's kind of let down by those flappy bits at the bottom of the main armour piece. It looks kind of dumb. Smo's armour isn't let down by anything though. The expression on the helm is unnerving as hell to me. It has a certain childlike or even angelic quality to it, while also being quietly menacing and malevolent, with the overall effect being made even stronger by the rest of the armour. Coolest thing about the headpiece though is that the face does not correspond to where your character's face lies within it. You actually look out from the slits along the neck, with the head part specifically being for both decoration and intimidation. While Dark Souls 1 certainly features its fair share of bulky, beefy armours, Smoes is without a doubt the beefiest, giving you the effect of a great golden behemoth if you choose to wear it. Obviously the real deal looks way bigger with it on, but still makes for a pretty gnarly get up, and one of the heaviest in the game too, though it is beaten out by Havel set and the giant set. As monstrous as the armour certainly is, I also appreciate the fact that it's not just a round mass of heavy metal. Small set is still highly decorative and detailed, with its grooves, shoulder spikes, the belt adorned with odd symbols, and the feet part of the leggings which are modelled after actual feet rather than just resembling boots or some such. And of course, who could forget the tits? <whistles> Back when I used to actually play PvP many years ago, 
I never really saw anyone wearing small set because it's extremely heavy, it lowers your stamina recovery rate, and most damningly of all, it doesn't go well with any other armour. The size and girth difference is just too great, making you look like a fool, a buffoon, if you try and mix and match. But I don't care about all that, Smoo's armour looks awesome. Aha, and now for our first Bloodborne set. Of course, Bloodborne doesn't really have armour as such, instead featuring lighter sets of protective clothing so as to maintain speed when fighting against beasts. But that's really just a lore-based distinction because mechanically these sets function exactly the same as armour, also featuring their own physical, elemental and status effect resistances. And hey, they look fucking awesome too. In fact, I could have gotten away with just featuring every Bloodborne clothing set in the game in this video, but instead I've focused on my absolute favourites, one of which is the Constable set. The Constable set is technically DLC only equipment, with the garb, gloves and trousers all being situated throughout the Hunter's Nightmare to be picked up from corpses, but the headpiece is nowhere to be found anywhere in the DLC. Rather, this bizarre article of headwear is worn by Volter, Master of the League, who appears in the Forbidden Woods, having been added into the game in patch 1.07 to coincide with the release of the DLC, though he'll still appear here regardless of whether or not you've bought the DLC. Volter is the Master of the League, an underground confederation of hunters and crushers of what are known as vermin, bloody centipede-like creatures hidden within filth, which the League claims are the root of man's impurity. You won't have encountered any such vermin yourself by the time you meet Volter, but after equipping the Impurity Rune, you can harvest it from co-op play or collect it as drops from three specific red-eyed old hunters throughout the Hunter's Nightmare. And after crushing five vermin, Volter will pass the mantle of League Master on to you, which means now we get to wear the Master's Iron Helm, thus completing the Enzembla. <laughs> Most of the sets found in Bloodborne are stylish, even the more ominous ones, but goddamn I think the Constable set looks uniquely fabulous. In fact, this might just be my favourite in the whole game, though the fact that it's worn by Volter is a big part of that too, because Volter is one of my favourite characters in the game. Even though we see Volter in, or I suppose just outside of Yarnum, this set actually originates from some unnamed foreign land, perhaps the same land where our very player character is from, because you do start off wearing the foreign set upon waking up in Ayasefka's clinic. It looks very distinct from pretty much any other set in the game, being one of the only ones to be coloured blue, lacking that characteristic dark leather look favoured by Yarnumites. The entire set, well, minus the bucket helm, is actually near identical to what Victoria era police constables wore, featuring the same button alignment, cape, and even also featuring a portable handheld lamp hanging from the right side of the waist. Sure, give me your sleek hunter sets and your black church garbs, they're all great, but for me, nothing matches the authoritative style of the constable set, especially the way it combines a real world uniform with a far more anomalous one-eyed bucket helm. Next up is our first but certainly not last set from Elden Ring, it's the Black Flame Monk set. This is kind of a two-in-one sort of deal too, because the Black Flame Monk set is the same as the Fire Monk set except blacker. Now, for every armour set I've discussed so far, there have been fairly organic ways of obtaining them, be it from simply picking them up throughout levels, purchasing them from merchants, or as a reward for killing a character or finishing a questline, and that's all great. But in other cases, and as was certainly the case for this armour set, you need to farm. <coughs> I didn't have to do any farming for any of the Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1 or Bloodborne sets in this video, but I sure as fuck did with Dark Souls 2 and 3 and Elden Ring. And it got a bit tedious at times, though at the same time it was also kind of enjoyable to just zone out and listen to some Dan Carlin's hardcore history whilst desperately trying to get the Fire Monk's gauntlets to drop. Oh please god, why won't the gauntlets drop? I farmed this guy here by the Guardian's Garrison on the mountaintops of the Giants for the Fire Monk set, and of course with the Silver Scarab Talisman and Mimic Tear Mask to raise my item discovery. And I also popped more than a few Silver Pickled Foul Feet until I eventually ran out, and it still took forever. See, the worst thing about farming for a set is that just because an enemy dropped a particular armour piece doesn't mean it won't drop that same piece again and again and again. 
By the time I eventually got the Fire Monk Hood, I had 7 Greaves, 6 pieces of armour and 6 gauntlets. It gets to the point where you think, is he ever going to drop that last piece I need? Can he drop it? What if he just never drops it? But then he did drop it and I was glad. But the main prize was the Black Flame Monk set, which I also had to farm for. Really rare enemy too, there are literally only two in the entire game. One in the Caled Divine Tower and the other here in Volcano Manor. Thankfully, didn't take anywhere near as long to get every piece I needed from the Black Flame Monk. And so again, I was glad. Although my pick is specifically for the Black Flame Monk set, I still wanted to show off both versions, because even though they do have the same design except for a colour change, I like that. It's a simple but cool and thematically apt way to show the different paths of these heretical monks. The Fire Monks were tasked with guarding the Flame of Ruin high up on the mountain tops of the Giants, the one that we as players unleash upon the Erd Tree after defeating the Fire Giant. And in fact, the terrible Cyclopean visage of the Fell God, the one who awakens during the fight with the Fire Giant, is vividly shown on the metallic chest piece of the Fire Monk set, amidst the bright red colour of the robes and hood. Meanwhile, the Black Flame Monk set is the same, except with black and grey robes instead of red, to represent the distinctive colour of the God-slaying Black Flame, though interestingly the face of the Fell God is still present on their chest pieces, perhaps showing that while they did abandon their charge of guarding the Flame of Ruin, some part of them still remains loyal to the terrible and powerful God they once worshipped. And while we are on the subject of Elden Ring and Fire, why not discuss a related armour set which I also think is pretty damn sick. The Fire Prelit set. I spoke about the lengthy ordeal of trying to get every Fire Monk armour piece, but while I was going through that I also happened to be farming the nearby Fire Prelit for its set. Not an easy task either by the way, these guys abilities are nothing to sneeze at and annoyingly there are tons of flame guardian enemies around too with a long range fire and briar attacks. I complained about how much of a bastard it was trying to get that one final piece of armour from the fire monk but for the fire prelates it was their gauntlets that proved to be absurdly elusive. In fact, before they eventually dropped, I had accumulated 12, yes 12 helms. 2 armours and 5 greaves. Speaking of their armours, you can find a unique fire prelate with altered armour in Fort Lyde on Mount Gelmir, which is a guaranteed drop for killing it. Same with the outrageous looking prelate's Infernal Crozier weapon. The struggle was worth it though, because I adore this set. The fire prelate is another rare and late game enemy, only being found in a few locations, but goddamn, they're great and a magnificent one, visually speaking. They wear similar red robes to the Fire Monks, in fact the Prelates themselves are the commanders of all Flame Guardians, with the Iron Cauldron atop their helms made to resemble the very crucible of the Giants which stands high above all else in the mountaintops. The item description for the headpiece states that the embers within this cauldron have long since died out, though as anyone who has fought a Fire Prelate will be well aware, it's not long in getting dramatically reignited. Sadly though, due to the helmet not being an actual weapon, you cannot make use of such attacks when you yourself wear it. Now that I think about it, that's something that's completely missing in all of FromSoft's games. There are no armour based attacks to speak of, though hopefully we see something like that in the future. The cauldron aside though, the Fire Prelit set isn't too dissimilar from Smo's set, also featuring a creepy face design on the helmet, also being very round and large, and also boasting a cracking pair of bajungas. The regular central armour piece looks great with its red cloth, but gotta say I prefer the altered version of it, which features no cloth or colour, instead simply exposing the raw black iron beneath in all of its glory. For as much as I love it, I think Executioner Smo's armour has a proper rival with the Fire Prelit set. And finally we have our first set from Demon's Souls. This game doesn't have as many to choose from and a lot of what is here is pretty tame compared to what would come in FromSoft's subsequent games, but there's still certainly some cool stuff to be found here, such as the Gloom set. A part of what gives the Gloom set its compelling aura is the character found wearing it, that being Yurt the Silent Chief, a dark and ominous man locked away inside a grim cage at the top of the Tower of Latria, who requests that you let him free. 
It's exactly like Dark Souls 1's Lortrex situation, though in Yurt's case you don't even need a key to free him. Once he is free though, he will migrate over to the Nexus, at least after aimlessly and awkwardly wandering around on this platform for a while, and once there he will gradually slaughter the residents of the Nexus. Again, not entirely dissimilar to how Lortrex will kill the Firekeeper if you don't boot him off a cliff first. Give me that fucking ring, you prick. Only way to stop Yurt carrying out his murderous crusade happens to be the same way you can get his gloom set. Just kill him. Either up in the Tower of Latria where you find him or in the Nexus, whichever you find most convenient. The gloom set is pretty damn heavy, having the exact same weight as the fluted set, though it's not as heavy as the brushwood or dark silver sets. I always thought Demon Souls made it way more awkward to use heavy armour than the other Souls games. Got to really pump the points into stamina so as to not fat roll. The Gloom set is certainly worth spending those few extra points though, because compared to pretty much any other set in the game, it's way more stylishly wicked. Most defining feature of it is of course the two pointed horns sticking out the top of the helmet, giving it a somewhat devilish aspect, and deservedly so when you consider the absolute bastard who the armour belongs to. It's not just the helmet though, the whole set oozes with edginess, both literally and figuratively. Its dark coloration gives it a distinctly evil aura, though you've also got the sharp pointed hands emerging out from each shoulder which, although pretty cool I guess, is definitely a case of style over practicality. Lautrec's set of favour from Dark Souls 1 also features a set of hands incorporated into its armour design, but at least they weren't akin to pointed daggers aiming directly at the head. I don't mean to poo poo the gloom set over much though, because I'm not rating armour sets in this video on their mechanical realism, but on their cool factor, and on that basis I rate the gloom set very highly indeed. Next up we have the Iron Golem set from Dark Souls 1. This is one of those sets that I wished we'd have seen in the other two Dark Souls games, but sadly it never did make a return. Just like the aforementioned Smoe set, the Iron Golem set is worn by a boss, that being the Iron Golem, obviously. And as such, it must be purchased from Dono after the boss's defeat. Nice and simple, and the full on Zombo only costs 22,000 souls. Hey, not bad. An interesting aspect of this set right off the bat is that the Iron Golem boss itself is essentially an automaton, rather than being any sort of truly living and conscious being, to the extent that you don't even get a boss soul after its defeat, you get a core, one made from the bone of an everlasting dragon. Thus, in a sense, the armour itself is a smaller version of the boss, only without the core and able to be worn as a shell by you. It's just like the smelter demon from Dark Souls 2, which is also just a wicked mass of iron, except given life with an actual soul in its case, and whose set you can also wear. Though no, the smelter demon set will not be appearing as an actual pick on this list. Yes, it looks pretty fucking gnarly, but the cool factor is kinda ruined with the weird midrift, is fully visible from both the front and the back. Back to the Iron Golem set though, while you may not look as big and intimidating as the real deal when wearing it, this is still one of the coolest looking heavy armour sets from any Dark Souls game. It's excessive in every regard, a collection of thick black chunks of iron shaped into the form of armour, with no thought for practicality or even the possibility of a human wearing it, because the armour was never intended to be worn by a human. It was simply supposed to act as a colossal vessel for the Dragonbone core, and the round hole where the core would be stored in is still visible on the front of the chest piece, almost like a mechanical twist on the dark sign, which afflicts Lord Rand's undead. There's not even holes or a slit in the helmet to see out of, because again, the Iron Golem did not require eyes, and the whole set is just sick as fuck. What do you want me to say here? Believe it or not, but the Iron Golem is actually one of my favourite bosses from Dark Souls 1. Not because it's particularly challenging to fight, because it's not, it's way too easy actually, but because it looks just about as badass as a boss can look. This black iron titan standing sentinel on top of a fortress to annihilate any and all would-be heroes who think to trespass onto an Orlando. Back to Elden Ring again and we're here to talk about the armour of a true and gallant knight. We're talking about Loretta's Royal Knight set. As for how it is obtained, well it's a boss armour set, and so just as with any other such set, it can be purchased from Finger Reader Enya after Loretta's defeat, though it has to be after her true defeat. 
You'll first encounter her as Royal Knight Loretta at the Royal Moon Gazing Grounds in Caria Manor where she guards the way to the Three Sisters. So just as with some other bosses like Margaret Fell Omen, Golden Godfrey and Moog the Omen, this isn't the true person, it's just a sort of powerful spirit projection and as such you don't really get to behold her in her true splendour due to her being all blue and spectral and shit. The real Loretta is up in the Halig Tree, guarding the way onto Elfail after she departed from the service of the Carrion Royal family to become Loretta, Knight of the Halig Tree. She did this after becoming determined that Mikola's Halig Tree could serve as a true home for the Albinorix, a misfortunate race of beings of which Loretta herself is theorised to be one of, specifically a first generation Albinoric, not those bizarre frogmen. I don't think Loretta is an amphibian. Now, as far as this set's appearance goes, I'll be the first to say that it looks kind of ridiculous. Elden Ring really went all out with its weapon and armour designs in a way that I love. There are tons of crazy and extravagant pieces of equipment here, from soft leather artists' imaginations run truly wild, and I'm glad they did, because it meant that they came up with unconventionally elegant armour designs like this, the most eye-catching aspect of which is the helm. It features a strange and somewhat inhuman expression on the face, though rather than it mimicking the cold expression of some monster, the shape of the eyes gives it a rather sad aspect. Never mind the face though. Hey lady, what's that on your damn head? Why is there an engraved golden disc sprouting boldly from your helmet? Hmm? I'm not sure if the tree design on the disc is supposed to represent the air tree or what the Haley tree ideally would have looked like had its growth not been stunted. Because this design is also present when you fight her spirit as Royal Knight Loretta back at Caria Manor, which is based on how she would have looked before departing for the Haley tree. But in any case, it's an extravagant piece of headwear, and for as ludicrous as it looks, I still really like it. Same with the rest of the armour pieces with their frilly floral flourishes and curves. Another reason why I like it though is that it reminds me of Judge Drace's armour from Final Fantasy XII. I'd love to show you a clip of Judge Drace from that game instead of this PNG. But the last time I made a Final Fantasy video it got demonetized. Fuck you Square Enix. Back to Demon Souls again for number 11, to one of the heaviest sets in the game too, the Dark Silver set. I guess this one can kind of be considered a boss armour too, though the knight it belongs to, Garo Vinland, is not himself a boss, but rather he is fought during the encounter with Maiden Astraea. You first hear of Maiden Astraea and her loyal Garo Vinland during the intro sequence when the narrator is naming some of the heroes who ventured through the thick, colourless fog back into the fallen kingdom of Boataria. She even mentions the aforementioned Yurt Silent Chief here. It's not until the final stage of the Valley of Defilement, however, that you get to meet this saintly duo, and for as pure and pretty as Astraea certainly looks here, the meeting is a grim affair. Since passing through the fog, Astraea has become the archdemon of the Valley of Defilement, abandoning the god she once served after seeing the squalid suffering of the inhabitants of the Valley to herself become their saint and saviour, their figure of hope and worship. Sounds kind of touching when considered at a surface level, but it has to be noted that the Valley of Defilement remains an absolute hellhole of disease, filth and terror, now even with demons roaming around to collect souls for the new Archdemon, to then flow into the abyssal maw of the Old One. And so for as sympathetic as we are sort of tricked into being for Astraea with her gentle smile and tender words, and by the beyond incredible track that accompanies the fight, or at least it was incredible in the original before they made it far more generic for the remake, I am not the greatest sympathiser of her actions, but I'm getting off track. Extremely cool moment at the beginning of the encounter is when Garol Vinland rises up from a gruesome pile of rotten human corpses before exchanging a loop, loop with his saint before coming to confront the player, clad in his distinctive dark silver armour which he will drop upon defeat, though it is heavy as fuck so you'll almost certainly have to send it to storage. I am glad they added that feature for the remake. Just like the Gloom set, the Dark Silver set stands out a lot due to how unconventional it looks in a game that doesn't really have that many outlandish armours. And as with many sets on this list, the headpiece is a big part of that. It may not be disc shaped like Loretta's helmet, but it is still pretty damn extravagant, meant to represent the sacred tree of Vinland, though curiously there doesn't seem to be any eye holes or slits in the face section for a person to see out of, but who cares, just makes it look both cooler and stranger really. 
Even though it's called dark silver armour, it looks more like a sort of white silver from some angles, but even so, I do always appreciate any sort of twist on the traditional shiny silver armour coloration and texture that we're all familiar with by now. FromSoft would kinda bring back Garol Vinland's general style with Paladin Leroy in Dark Souls 1, who himself was another warrior of God, though I guess the biggest similarity between the two figures is not so much their armour sets but their weapons, with Garol wielding Brand, an enormous iron hammer, whilst Leroy wields Grant, an enormous iron hammer. Leroy would not be the only callback to Garol Vinland though, which brings us on to our next armour set. At number 12 I have Velstat's set, which might just be my single favourite set in Dark Souls 2. It's boss armour and so in traditional FromSoft fashion, after Velstat has been defeated it can be purchased from Molin the Armourer in Medulla. Pretty expensive too, it will set you back about 45k souls. Once again we've got a holy warrior wielding an enormous blessed hammer, though Verstat looks way more similar to Garol Vinland than Leroy did, most notably due to the triangular headpiece. Whereas Garol's set was dark silver though, Verstat's is the colour of brass or bronze, and I guess excluding the headpiece, the rest of the set looks fairly distinct. For a start, the face portion isn't completely covered with metal anymore, and Verstat's set features a dark purple cape which kinda has the texture of scales. A pretty cool Demon Souls callback though is that just as Saint Astraea summons Garol Vinland up from a fetid mire, Elana's Squalid Queen can summon up Velstat from some unseen mire during the boss fight with her, and the colour of his weapon and armour is different here too. Kinda looks like he's covered in shit, to be honest. Ooh. I'm a massive fan of Velstat as a boss, I think he's great fun to fight, but his backstory is great too, and his presentation is quite cleverly done. He's been corrupted by the dark due to his exposure to it down here in the undead crypt where he guards the way to King Vendrick, to the extent that even his soul has taken on the bursting purple hue of the dark, it looks very similar to the soul of Artorius from Dark Souls 1. The difference though is that with Artorius you can instantly tell that he has completely lost it, not only by his wild animalistic motions but by his ragged, dark drenched armour, whereas with Velstat there is no immediate visual giveaway. His weapon and armour appear completely clean and pure, perhaps because they were once blessed with miracles to make them more resistant to the dark. It's only at the halfway point of the fight that Velstat reveals the true extent of his internal corruption, channeling the power of the dark with his sacred chime hammer, and I just really love how you're sort of tricked into initially thinking he's managed to remain pure, clad in his magnificent blessed armour in a position of prayer within the solitary beam of light left in the crypt, before the truth is revealed. All that aside though, I just think his armour looks really fucking cool, okay? Let's stick with Dark Souls 2, please, and with an armour set whose owner actually has an important connection to Velstat, it's Reim's set. And with it being a boss set, no fancy quest lines to complete or hour and a half long farming sessions needed to get it, just got to defeat the Fume Knight and then purchase it from Magarold over in the Iron Keep. Just like Velstat, Reim was a knight who served King Vendrick in Drang Lake and considered one of the finest warriors in his kingdom, but for whatever reason he and Velstat fought, a fight which Velstat won, after which Reim was exiled before making his way to Broom Tower in search of greater strength. And indeed he found that strength after becoming infatuated with a child of the dark, Nadalia, Bride of Ash. It's even implied that fragments of Nadalia's soul live within Reim's weapons. Plus, defeating the Fune Knight also grants you a fragment of Nadalia's soul alongside Reim's own soul, which happens to look identical to Velstat's soul. Some people have even theorised these two as being brothers. Really cool feature is that if you enter the Fume Knight boss arena wearing Velstat's distinctive helm, the Fume Knight will transition to phase 2 right off the bat, which you may or may not find desirable. One thing is for sure though, Reim's set is completely different in style and appearance to Velstat's, they have wholly different vibes. Whereas Velstat's is quite resplendent, especially with its bright coloration, Reim's is raven black, and indeed as the item description for his rebel's great shield states, the black raven is despised as an augur of death, but it was Reim's favourite bird. His armour seems to be made out of the same black slate material as his Fume Ultra Greatsword, or at least it shares its colour, 
Honestly though, I think the armour set that Reims has most in common with is the Iron Dragon Slayer set. It's not quite as thick and brutal, certainly not the helmet piece, but its indentations and grooves do resemble its scorched rawness. My favourite thing about this set though really is its stark blackness. There's no colour to be found anywhere, not even on the robed section at the rear. The armour is pure dark, perhaps in tribute to the dark soul of the Bride of Ash. Let's take a break from all that heavy armour for a bit and return to Yarnum for a spell to talk about the Executioner set. Mind you, even though we're not talking about a suit of armour here, this set certainly carries on the theme of extravagant headwear. The garb, gauntlets and trousers can all be picked up from a corpse in Canehurst Castle, though just like the Master's Iron Helm as part of the Constable set, you do not pick up the gold Ardeo helmet here. To get that, you need the Wheel Hunter's badge, which, one way or another, you can get from Alfred. You can try and kill him the very first time you see the man in Cathedral Ward just before old Yarnum, but he's fucking hard, and so this is not at all recommended if you're quite low leveled, though you might feel more confident in taking him on by the time he moves over by the entrance to the Forbidden Woods. Or if you want to do it all by the book, you can just complete his questline, and you really should too because it's short and simple, and it concludes with one of the sickest moments in the whole game, where for the first time you get to see Alfred wearing the full Executioner set complete with the gold Ardeo. Though the figure featured on the stone statue where you first meet him is also seen in full Executioner regalia. If you just presented me with the Executioner set sans the helmet, I would tell you, Hey, that's a pretty nice set you got there, little buddy. Hey, that's a pretty nice set you... Fuck. Hey, I just want to tell you that's a pretty nice set you got there, little buddy. Hey, that's a pretty nice set you got there, little buddy. That's the best I can do. The set is light, flowing and elegant while still appearing quite robust, and even though the Executioners are a separate group from the Church Hunters, this garb would later become the basis for all Church attire. In fact, you can even see Ludwig, who was the first hunter of the church, wearing what looks like tattered scraps of the Executioner set during his boss fight. Even so, the garb, gauntlets and trousers alone aren't quite interesting enough for me to include it into the top 50, but when you take the gold Ardeo into consideration, yeah, this is some top tier fashion souls, fashion born. It's a wholly intriguing combination of fairly conventional elegance with something way more weird, this bizarre golden ornament, said to be a symbol of luminosity, ambition and unflagging resolve to face impurity. Staring it down with stern golden spirit, just like, I suppose, Alfred would ultimately do when he crushed, pounded and mashed Annalise, queen of the Vilebloods, into a squirming pink paste. Let's leave behind the gory, crimson madness of Bloodborne for now and return back to Dark Souls 2, this time to the Hyde Knights set, and the first Dark Souls 2 set on this list so far that I actually had to farm for, oh you bet I did. See, farming can be uniquely irritating when it comes to this game. For every other Soulsborne game, if there's any enemy with a set you might want and you know there's no other way to get it, just got to keep killing them until you get what you need. Might take a damn while, but it's a straightforward enough process. In Dark Souls 2 though, enemies don't stick around forever. After you kill something 12 times, it will no longer respawn after you touch a bonfire. Obviously FromSoft did this so that players who were truly struggling in particular levels could catch a break after so many attempts, to gradually render the level easier the more enemies despawn from it, but of course, this is far from ideal if you want to farm equipment, cause the last thing you want to happen then is for enemies to start disappearing along with the chance to claim their sweet loot. There are workarounds however. For one, you can join the Covenant of Champions, which means enemies will never despawn, but this also makes enemies very noticeably harder, making the process of farming that much more painful. And furthermore, if you already despawned an enemy prior to joining the Covenant, they don't come back. The other way to make shit reappear is to use a bonfire aesthetic to locally raise the new game plus number, but just like the Covenant of Champions, this makes things harder, and enemies will still despawn after their 12 lives are up. And I had to contend with all this when farming for the Hyde Knight set. 
The drop rates for the hide equipment are super low, and let's not forget that these knights are pretty difficult enemies. In fact, I don't think I like them very much. Their attacks are weird as hell and have a sort of odd rhythm to them that I never quite got to grips with and the scholar of the first sin version of Hyde's Tower of Flame is bloody outrageous with its increased concentration of enemies, not to mention the extra ones and the phantoms if you happen to be on New Game Plus like I was. That said, this was also kind of a blessing, because even though I did despawn several Hyde Knights throughout this level, there was still enough of them dotted around for me to farm, but god damn did it take a while. With the fire prelates and fire monks from Elden Ring, I was getting tons of drops, it's just that I wasn't getting the right drops that I needed to complete the set, but I was barely getting anything with the Hyde Knights. In fact, I never managed to get the Hyde Great Helm, it just would not fucking drop for me, but thankfully, an alternate helmet did exist, that being the Hyde Knight Iron Mask, which is a guaranteed drop from the non-respawning one very well hidden away down in the gutter. The issue was, the first time I fought him here, he actually killed me, because he's pretty tough, though upon returning back to the same spot directly afterwards, I realised he was gone. There is an edge here, which he must have fallen over right as he killed me, which meant no Hyde Knight Iron Mask for me. Cool, great, okay then, fine. Thankfully though, bonfire aesthetics are a thing and I simply had to burn one here to shift the gutter up one difficulty level, which also respawned the Hyde Knight, finally allowing me to complete the set. Gotta be honest, two folks, all that grafting was completely worth it, cause hot dog, this is some majestic armour, I mean it's pretty much perfect. I know I said earlier that their stat set might be my favourite in Dark Souls 2, but nah, I think it might just be the Hyde Knight set. Dark Souls 2 has gotten a hell of a lot of flack over the years for all sorts of reasons, but through it all there's always been one thing that everyone seems to agree with. It has a ton of incredibly sick armour and weapon designs. I mean, some of FromSoft's bloody best. Not just big and wicked looking equipment either, but some really detailed and interesting pieces, and I think the hide set is a perfect example of that, especially with its distinctive white cloth. Lots of armour sets are made edgier and certainly cooler thanks to their dark colour schemes, and I've already named a few such armour sets here in this video, but ones that focus on brightness, like this one, can be just as, if not more, visually appealing. Been a wee while since we spoke about anything exclusive to Dark Souls 3, but folks, I could not possibly make a coolest Soulsborne armour video without highlighting the Ringed Knight set. This is another case where I had to farm, farm, farm for what I desired, though as discussed- oh, I just bit my tongue there, sorry. Though as discussed, farming at its core <laughs> <laughs> isn't as big a pain in the arse here as it was in Dark Souls 2. Mind you, let's not forget the fact that the Ring Knights make for very tough opponents, one of the most difficult in the game in fact, and they come in three different variants, sporting either a sword and shield, spear and great shield, or paired great swords, meaning collectively they have a ton of different attacks in their arsenal, big, terrifying, fiery attacks, not only from their weapons, but also from their draconic shields, and that means they are not easy to quickly farm. I initially tried focusing on this section to the side of the swamp, but soon realised it wasn't going to work. Yes, there are a lot of them here, but too many, actually. I was getting overwhelmed, and worst of all, the giant here spots you as you try to move across, meaning you've got volleys of arrows to deal with too, or the Silver Knight Ledo Spectre. I originally thought, hey, no big deal, I will just kill the giant, only to discover that he fucking respawns. I do love the placement of this giant here, it makes for a powerfully depressing sight, seeing this towering titan wading through this desolate swamp at the edge of the world, roaring into the sky in hostile anguish. But even so, he has no bloody business respawning, should be a one and done type deal, thank you very much, wham bam, thank you ma'am. And so I just decided to farm the paired greatsword wielding one standing outside the church of Filianor. He was still a really formidable enemy, but far more manageable with him being on his own. Even so, just like with the Hyde Knight set, this took well over an hour. Got to the point where all I needed to complete the set was its main armour piece, but I just kept getting everything except the armour. However, I did discover that they can literally drop four titanite chunks at a time. It's pretty nuts. Did get what I needed eventually though, and as always, it was well worth it. 
The ringed set is quite unlike any other on this list in that it is implied to be partially alive in a sense due to it having been forged in the abyss, though its malformed black appearance does give a passive resemblance to the armour of Gwyn's Black Knights, whose souls were burnt to ashes and whose own armour would be warped, scorched and blackened after Gwyn linked his own soul to the first flame, an act which kicked off the endless cycle of soul sacrifice needed to keep the flame burning until the age of Dark Souls 3 where the world has become completely stagnant. Interestingly, you can also see horns sprouting off irregularly from the Ring Knight's armour, not to mention from their various weapons, with these horns looking very similar to those found on the goat-like Gru found throughout Farin Keep and the Demon Ruins. And of course, horns would also come to represent primordial life in Elden Ring, manifesting on the bodies of the Misbegotten and Omens. The single most defining feature of this set, however, is of course, the Ring the scorching seal of fire glaring from the front of the armour, cast there by the gods in defiance of the Dark of the Abyss, though the Ring Knights in turn would don layers of cloth around their eyes in defiance of the gods, paying homage to the Dark through self-imposed blindness. Unbelievably cool level, incredibly cool enemy, and extremely cool armour set. Let's go back to Dark Souls roots for number 17 please, travelling all the way over to Darkroot Forest, the same place where we found the Elite Knight set, though the armour we're concerned with here does not originate from the likes of Astora, but rather from the East. It is the Eastern set. The Eastern set is of course worn by Shiva of the East, who is one of my favourite characters in Dark Souls 1. Shiva doesn't really have an actual questline, at least not one which was included in the final version of the game, but even so, he's interesting, friendly, and is superbly voice acted. And that's why I'm glad as hell that you don't have to actually kill him to get a hold of his armour, because you can find the entire eastern set perched on a cliff at the far side of the forest. Though if you want his Marakumo curved greatsword and round iron shield, you do have to take him down. Like a number of other armour sets, the Eastern set skipped a game, not being obtainable anywhere in Dark Souls 2, though you can purchase the Marakumo from Weaponsmith Ornifex, and its item description even mentions it being brought to this land by a foreign warrior, clearly referencing Shiva. But in Dark Souls 3, the armour was brought back, just got to pick up the Easterner's ashes in Anor Londo and hand it off to the Shrine Maiden, who then lets you purchase the full set. FromSoft is a Japanese company of course, but for the most part the themes and aesthetics of their games are very western based, in the realm of dark medieval fantasy with knights and castles and wizards and such, but even so there are several characters and pieces of equipment which are very much eastern inspired. I think it's really interesting how there is some vast eastern land in the Dark Souls universe, a place home to samurai and enormous horned oni, but a place that's only ever referenced in item descriptions and such. It's like with George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, where you have places like Leng and E.T. and Ashai far to the east that are sometimes mentioned but never actually explored by the main characters, at least not yet anyway. I really appreciate this sort of world building, because it gives you just enough information to get you intrigued, only to leave the rest to your imagination instead of telling you exactly what these faraway places are actually like. Anyway, the Eastern set with its Asian influence looks like nothing else in Dark Souls 1. Sure, you have your katanas and such, but none are as stylish as this magnificently detailed set. The helmet seems to be inspired by a kendo mask, except with a fuller, more metallic design, though my favourite detail is the large iron lion, which makes up the left pauldron. Indeed, pretty much every inch of this set is embroidered and decorated, with black and gold flourishes and medallions, and just like with the Elite Knight set, it features a bunch of ambiguous belts and pouches and pockets, and it all just makes for a very eye-catching, elegant and unique overall design. I would like to stick with this theme for a bit longer please, because while Dark Souls 2 did not feature the Eastern set, that sure doesn't mean we did not see similarly styled armours in this game, which brings me to my next pick, Alon's set. Sir Alon is of course a DLC boss, and one of the best damn bosses in the game too, I don't think there are too many folks out there who would disagree with that. Long before you face off against the legendary warrior himself though, you encounter his knights and captains littered in frankly absurd number throughout the Iron Keep, especially in the score of the first Sin version of the game, seriously there are way too many enemies here now. 
The fighting style of the Elon Knights is distinct from pretty much any other knight who you have fought thus far, with them favouring the dex focused black steel katana weapon which they use to thrust and slice with abnormally quick and sudden movements. And the reason they strike in such a manner is because their teacher or idol was Sir Elon himself, a mysterious warrior from a distant land who chose to serve the old Iron King, at least until the king's descent into demonic depravity. The armour sets of Alon Knights is pretty cool and quite lightweight for heavy armour, though there's not that much of an eastern influence to their designs. The armour of the Alon Captains is a different story though, particularly the face portion of the helmet with its multiple horizontal slits, modelled so in tribute to the armour of Sir Alon himself, who you can challenge after entering into the memory of the old Iron King, which notably you transition into after touching Sir Alon's very armour, which glows red after the Feud Knight is defeated, and after you've got the Ashen Mist Heart. And after defeating him, at least after fighting through what I consider to be the single worst level in all of Soulsborne, you can purchase the full Alon set from Magarod, though it is really fucking expensive at nearly 75,000 bucks. As ever though, if you've got any sort of passion for fashion, you really shouldn't have any misgivings about forking over all those hard-earned Samoans for what is arguably the sickest armour set in the game. I know I already said much the same thing about both the stat set and the Hyde Knight set, but come on, look at this magnificence, gaze at it. Whereas Shiva's Eastern set from the first and third games has a very odd but appealing overall design to it, a lawn set is full on traditional samurai armour, with the exception of the helmet which again features that same sort of kendo mask horizontal slit design. As far as Souls is concerned, the Elon set is the king of this style of armour, and we would have to wait until Sekiro came around in 2019 before we'd get to see anything that might rival its eastern excellence, with the likes of the Seven Ashenous Spears and various general mini-bosses also boasting superbly stylish armour, though of course, after Sekiro came Elden Ring. And with the coming of Elden Ring, we got even more Japanese influenced equipment to wear and wield, like my pick for number 19, the Ronin set. To my knowledge, the place where characters like Shiva and Sir Alon came from isn't actually named anywhere, unlike how we know that Siegmeier is from Katarina and that Oscar, Andre and Soleil are from Astora, but in the Elden Ring universe this distant eastern place is known as the Land of Reeds. You can even begin your playthrough with the Land of Reeds set if you pick the Samurai starting class. We encounter a few characters from the Land of Reeds too, like Bloody Finger Okina, who wears the White Reed set, and then there's Violet Bloody Finger Eleonora, though she's garbed in the Drake Knight set with respect to her dragon fixation. But finally, we have Bloody Finger Hunter Yura, who wears the Ronin set. If you are a particularly fashion hungry player, you might feel inclined to say, to hell with the quest line and strike Yura down as soon as you see him so as to obtain his fantastical attire. However, this would be folly, because although he will drop his enormous Nagakiba weapon, he will not drop his armour when killed here. To get the Ronin set, you've got to make it all the way to the mountain tops of the Giants, where, regardless of whether or not you completed Yura's questline before coming here, Shabriri will show up, having possessed his body, unless you already inherited the Flame of Frenzy from the Three Fingers, in which case the Ronin set will simply be here for you to pick up. Short of that though, got to kill Shabriri here for it to drop. Yet again, but certainly not for the last time, while the set looks incredibly detailed and stylish, it is the headpiece that is the true star of the show, the Iron Casa, crafted to imitate the woven straw hats worn in the Land of Reeds, except with an elegant metallic twist. The Casa makes it difficult to see the wearer's face too, which gets somewhat obscured by shadow when worn, though of course when we see Shabriri with it on, he's covering his face with his hands anyway. As aesthetically appealing as it certainly is, the Ronin set is not what would traditionally be worn by knights or indeed samurai in the Land of Reeds, with it trading in some of the colourful extravagance of conventional samurai attire in favour of lightness and greater functionality. Though it's certainly not totally without unnecessary adornments, still featuring a faded cape emblazoned with stripes of gold. I could have went for the Land of Reeds set or the White Reed set, 
for my pick here, because they both do look fantastic. But again, whilst they certainly don't look generic, they do look that bit more conventional in comparison, and thus are somewhat less interesting to me than the more mysterious and striking Ronin set. And so I simply had to choose it. Well, I simply had to. Back to Bloodborne, folks, and in fact, turns out I told a bit of a fib earlier on in the video when I said that this game does not have any armour, because it does in fact have the Kanehurst set. Though let's not go crazy now. Whilst this is by far the most metallic outfit in Bloodborne, it's really not akin to your heavy armours and such from Dark Souls. To get it, as you'd expect, got to travel over to Forsaken Castle Kanehurst from Hemwick Channel Lane, after picking up the Kanehurst summons from Iasefka's clinic. And after climbing the cold castle to its frigid rooftops and defeating Martyr Logarius, you can don the Crown of Illusions, so as to gain an audience with Queen Annalise whereupon you may become a vile blood, but just don't tell Alfred otherwise he'll go mental. Joining the vile bloods will get you the Kanehurst badge, which as well as allowing you to purchase the Chikage from the messenger shop also lets you get the Kanehurst set, though beware, it is absurdly expensive. Is the armour worth all those blood echoes though? Well, yes. Come on, look at it. There are one or two other sets which boast some amount of protective metal within their designs, but this set is wholly metallic, and as such, it boasts nearly the highest physical defence of any set in the game, being only just beaten by Simon's Harold set. Don't let it fool you though, this sure ain't tantamount to your heavy armours from Souls and such, because the material is specifically made from paper thin silver, hardly the strongest of all metals, though light enough to allow for the level of swiftness required for beast slaying, and it affords superb defence against blood based attacks, though not as high as what the Knight set affords you. The Knight set is also to be found in Kanehurst, though rather than this attire featuring any degree of metallic shielding, it is entirely elegant, refined and colourful in its aesthetic, looking more akin to what one would wear to a ball rather than a bloody battle. But that all just ties into the vulgar decadence associated with Castle Kanehurst, known for its more artistic and perversely refined brand of beast slaying, compared to the stark humourless madness of the Hunters of Yarnum. But never mind all that pompous, noble nonsense, I'll take the Kanehurst set please. Not just because it's Bloodborne's only example of actual armour, but because it's an example of damn fine looking armour. I'd have chosen it for this list even if it had appeared in Dark Souls or Elden Ring. I bet there were a few of you sitting there thinking, when's he gonna talk about Artorius? Artorius is set better be on this fucking list. <sighs> well, it is on the list, obviously. Who do you think I am? and it's another set that skipped Dark Souls 2 before once again returning for the third game. You acquire Artorius' set the same way you can other boss armours, that being by paying a visit to Dono of Zena under the bridge after defeating Knight Artorius over in Ulysseal. Though just like the Kanehurst set, it's another very expensive one, setting you back 20k souls for every piece purchased. As for Dark Souls 2, like I said, the Wolf Knight's armour does not appear, though its Abyss Greatsword does as the Majestic Greatsword, which even has an expanded moveset when you wield it in your left hand. Artorius himself wields his weapon with his right hand when you fight him as a boss, but that's just because his left arm is useless and broken after sustaining a grievous injury down in the Abyss, presumably at the monstrous hands of Manus. Just like in Dark Souls 1, the set must be purchased in the third game, specifically from the Shrine Maiden in the dark and very creepy version of Firelink Shrine in the Untended Graves, though thankfully it ain't as expensive this time round, and furthermore it's known as the Wolf Knight set in this game, with Artorius' actual name having long been forgotten. Just like the Elite Knight set, Artorius' set is damn legendary, not least of all because of what an awesome boss Artorius himself is. In fact, I think he's hands down the best boss in Dark Souls 1. But let's not get unnecessarily sidetracked and dazzled by the enjoyability of his mechanics as a boss, because the aesthetics of his armour alone are more than enough to earn a place on this list. I spoke about another dark tainted character earlier on, that being Velstat, though as I said there, his armour and weapon appear deceptively pure and pristine in form and colour, but for Artorius' set, the abyssal corruption is immediately apparent. Which makes sense, the dark seeped into Velstat's soul over time, whereas Artorius plunged himself headlong into it. 
The armour itself doesn't appear to be too compromised structurally, but it's the tattered azure blue cape that really tells the story. You can still see a golden pattern emblazoned on the back, but it's completely frayed at the bottom and even damp from being drenched in the dark purple fluids of the abyss, just as Artorius' soul itself would be drenched. And that also applies to the soaked tassels sprouting off from his helmet, which, although Artorius was known as the Wolf Knight, one of the four knights of Gwyn, is shaped like a bird's beak. In Dark Souls 3, the armour is in much the same condition, though slightly more frayed and discoloured in places, but the black vein-like flow of the abyss can still be seen in some places, such as along the gauntlets. And even though countless ages have passed since Artorius walked the abyss, his twilight blue helmet tassel is as damp with the dark as it ever was and ever will be. Artorius is a legendary FromSoft boss with a top tier design, and that includes his Abyss Greatsword weapon, which I consider to be the single coolest boss weapon in Dark Souls 1. And even though this is not a ranking video, if it were, Artorius' set would probably be in the top 3. Of course, even though Artorius did meet a tragic end, completely losing his mind to the Abyss, not only would he leave behind a legacy of unflinching duty and heroism, but also his wolf blood. Blood that would be consumed and shared between a new set of heroes, the Undead Legion. Yes indeed, we cannot talk about how cool Artorius and his set is without also giving a massive shout out to the Undead Legion, the Abyss Watchers, who serve as collective lords of Cinder through their shared wolf blood, providing a fantastic and memorable boss battle accompanied by one of the all-time greatest boss soundtracks. And after the defeat, their set can be purchased from the Shrine Maiden. Although the Undead Legion were inspired by Artorius' fight against the Abyss, both sets are quite different in appearance, The one attribute they do share is that they are both fairly light, so as to allow for the sort of fanciful attacks and manoeuvres that both bosses perform throughout their respective boss fights. In fact, there are even iron kneecaps affixed to the Undead Legion's leggings, so as to allow for their aggressive sliding and gliding fighting style. Much of the set features black dyed leather with segments of iron armour and chainmail for added protection, though the most striking source of black is without a doubt the veins flowing darkly up from the frayed lower edges of their capes, though even more notably around their distinctive pointed helmets, tying into the tragedy and irony of the Undead Legion, that being that in fighting the Abyss they were always doomed to eventually become infected by it. Though instead of the story of Artorius, who was a lone knight apart from his canine companion Sif, here we have an entire legion of infected heroes who are so devoted in their abyss fighting mission that they are locked in an endless battle in this corpse littered hall, slaughtering each other and then resurrecting due to their undead curse, only for the battle to begin yet again in an eternal cycle, at least until the unkindled one ends their abyssal torment. Something I really like about the set is the description of the pointed helmet, which reads, This pointed steel helm was a distinct symbol of the Legion, shirked as a sinister omen by the masses. The reason I like this detail so much is that for as heroic and tragic as I am painting the Undead Legion as being, this adds a more morally uncomfortable aspect to their story. Because it implies that regardless of who or where you were, if you caught sight of this ominous helm in your town, city or even kingdom, it meant that you, and everyone you knew, were going to be mercilessly wiped out, so unflinching and single-mindedly focused were the Abyss Watchers in their mission at stamping out even the smallest trace of the Abyss wherever it appeared, even if where it appeared was within themselves. But now we have our first example of a non-Bloodborne set which is more akin to clothing rather than armour. It's the Preceptor set from Elden Ring. Funnily enough, even though I love the way this set looks, I most certainly do not love the two individuals who wear it, those being Preceptor Miriam found in the Carrion Study Hall, whom I consider to be the single most obnoxious and bothersome enemy phantom in the entire game. She's like an even more annoying version of the Crystal Sage from the Grand Archives in Dark Souls 3. And there's also Selavis, Rani's preceptor of the Sorceress Arts, found in his tower in the Three Sisters beyond Caria Manor, and who is also an arsehole. As such, you bet I took delight in striking him down for a set, only to discover that even though you can deplete his HP here, he is unkillable at this point, and will straight up disappear until you use a Celestial Dew of the Church of Vows to bring him back. 
It was really annoying too because I had another save file on my PlayStation where I have every part of the Preceptor set except for the long gown. I guess I must have sold it at some point, and so I had to play through Rani's entire questline yet again, which, upon being completed, allows you to go back to Selvis' tower and pick up his set from his corpse, with him presumably having been killed by Blythe who frenzies just outside Rani's tower nearby. What a bloody hullabaloo, all for a fucking gown. However, I chose the Preceptor set for a damn good reason, and that reason is that I think it looks fabulous. It's almost like a play on Big Hat Logan's attire from Dark Souls 1, who is also a master of sorcery. Except here it's so much more colourful and extravagant, and the hat brim diameter has never been longer. The fate of the Carrion royal family is inherently linked to the stars, hence why they have a royal moon gazing grounds complete with a large astrolabe at the top of their very manor, and this celestial aspect is represented on the preceptor's own clothing, with the underside of the hat and the front of the gown being coloured in azure blue, the same colour as Carrion magic, and the movements of the stars are also drawn in wondrous patterns along the gown and hat. The gloves and trousers are a far more simple and silent black though, and speaking of silence, there's an altered version of the headpiece that you can find in the Carrion study hall called the Mask of Confidence, with the mouth section crisscrossed out to symbolise the preceptor's silence when it came to Radigan and Renala's private affairs. The crisscross pattern is actually the same type seen on the statues of Radigan around the lands between. The Preceptor set certainly isn't the biggest and bulkiest armour in the game, in fact it isn't even armour at all really, but it looks fantastic and colourful, with a bunch of really cool details, which I personally find to be rather spellbinding. But folks, if you thought we were done with your more mage oriented sets, think again, because at numbers 24 and 25 I have Azure set and Lusat set. Now these are different sets which you get at totally different places, but I'm covering both of them at once because the idea behind them is very similar, they look very similar, and you obtain both of them at the end of the same questline. In the Waypoint Ruins in Lingrave, just to the east of Lake Agil, you can find a sorceress named Selen, a scholar originating from the Academy of Rhea Lucaria no less, as indicated by her grand glintstone crown. Though as we later find out, she was in fact expelled from the Academy as a witch due to her obsession with the primeval sorceries, a study which was deemed forbidden after the mental and physical ruination of two of the Academy's finest ever scholars, Grand Masters Azure and Lusat. In fact, you can even find the glintstone crowns corresponding to these two figures, those being the Karalos crown and the Olivenous crown, both of which increase your intelligence stats by three points. Hey, not bad. Neither of these two mysterious figures are to be found at the Academy though, and in fact, if you travel just beyond the very remote Hermit Village on Mount Gelmir, you can find Grand Master Azure, a frightfully large figure with bright green glintstone growing out of his heads, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Although you cannot interact with him in any meaningful way, he does bequeath you with the Comet Azure spell, with a subtle motion of his left hand, the most powerful sorcery in the game, and one of only three primeval sorceries, though you can't get his set at this point. From here, returning back to Selen will have her give you a key which she says can be used to access the other primeval Grand Master, Lusat. And indeed, after probably getting lost for about 20 fucking minutes in the Celia hideaway cave in Caelid, Lusat can be found hidden away behind a magical barrier, which can be broken with a special key. Though he is in precisely the same state as Azure, except with a differently shaped and coloured glintstone core coming out of his head. Just as Azure gives you Comet Azure, Lusat hands off his own primeval sorcery, Stars of Ruin, though still no actual set. If you want those, which I do, got to complete Selen's questline, after which you can simply pick up their sets from where their bodies originally were before they were moved back into the academy by Selen. Mind you, important note here is that you can completely fuck yourself out of getting these sets if you choose to help Jeren fight Selen instead of the other way around, in which case your next chance to get them is in the next new game plus cycle. Ouch. These sets might be profoundly different in nature and certainly colour when compared to most armour sets in this list, but that's exactly what makes them so interesting and cool looking. Both Azure and Lusat were so advanced in their intellect that they succeeded at glimpsing into the primeval current, except clearly this was not something that man was ever supposed to see. 
In the case of Azure, a long shard of crystal replaced his skull after he saw the infinite primeval darkness, leaving him a bewitched crystalline transhuman mass. A cool detail is that the colour of the crystal embedded in the headpiece of his set is the same colour as the Comet Azure spell, which is exactly the same case with Lusat's Stars of Darkness, which is the same deep dark blue as the enormous glintstone sphere which replaced his skull. Both sets are super cool, but I definitely prefer Lusat's. I love that deep blue colour, and the Sphere's formation looks even more alien than the Shard formation of Azure's set. Furthermore, the Crystal Sphere kind of resembles an eye, not too dissimilar to Estelle's single eye, staring out from beneath its dreadful skull. And the variant of Estelle found in the Consecrated Snowfields is specifically called Estelle Stars of Darkness, which sounds kind of similar to Lestat's Stars of Ruin Sorcery. I love a good shiny knight's armour as much as the next person, a robust collection of chainmail, black iron plates and leather with some fancy cape showing a grand family crest, but I also love shit like this. Your more anomalous sets which feature strange shapes and colours born from dark cosmic currents, it's borderline Lovecraftian but with a glintstone twist to make it even more interesting. In short, it's pretty goddamn cool. Well folks, that concludes part 1 of this project, the first 25 of what I consider to be the coolest armour sets in all of Soulsburn, we've got plenty of good shit still to come, so if you're pissed that your favourite designs weren't showcased, here, hey maybe they'll be in part 2, so tune in for that, in any case I sincerely hope you enjoy my video. Please allow me to give another massive thank you to my wonderful Patreons for supporting the channel, and with all that being said, cheers for watching and cheerio.